Hey everyone, today I'm going to be covering two topics. How to set up an old-timey shader using Unity's shader graph, and how to make a full screen shader effect in the Universal Render Pipeline, or URP. I'm Game Dev Bill. Let's get started. To set up an old-timey movie effect, you're generally either going to start in black and white or sepia, and then the rest of the effect kind of unfolds from there. Now, sepia is just black and white that's then tinted kind of brownish, so I'm going to do that just because it's a little more complicated, and then at the end I'll actually show you how to switch it back to the black and white version. But after making the scene sepia, I'm going to then add kind of a flicker that darkens the screen randomly, add some spots that are falling on the down the screen, and then add some lines as well. Now, when you're doing sepia-based effect, you generally want those spots and lines to darken your scene. When you're doing black and white, they should brighten it. They're usually white specks and white lines. Now, I want this to be a full screen effect, which is also known as a custom post process or a full screen shader, something like that. That's what we want to use today. And what that means is that we're running our shader on the entire scene, not individual objects. It's a little tricky to set it up in URP, so I'll walk through that at the beginning. There's a lot of details to cover here. I may go a little bit fast, but for more info, to dive deeper or to copy paste some code, head over to gamedevbuild.com. In the description below, I'll have a link to a specific article that's tied to this video. To start off, I've already got a scene set up that I want to kind of old movieify, and I've made a shader. It's an unlit shader graph. It has nothing in it right now except the master node. Uh, and remember, if you're doing a full screen effect, there's no such thing as lighting, so unlit is the way to go there. Uh, I mean, I've already made a material based on this shader. To set up a full screen shader in URP, you do need the shader material, which I've already created, and then you're going to need to create in C Sharp a custom renderer feature. Now, Unity's actually provided sample code that pretty much does this. There's another tutorial creator online named Cyan who created, who modified that Unity version, and then I've actually copied the one from Cyan and modified it a little bit more myself. So it's available on my website. I also link back to Cyan's copy. And you don't really need to know what's going on inside this file. You can pretty much just copy it from my website or from Cyan's and go from there. So after getting that code from some website somewhere, you just put it in your project anywhere here I've got blit.cs in a folder called scripts, and then I can go over to a folder called settings, which URP automatically sets up for you, and that's where URP has put your forward renderer asset. So you select it, and you have the option to add a custom render feature. So I'm going to add blit. You can see it just automatically shows up. You can name it whatever you want. That doesn't matter. Also, the texture ID doesn't actually matter, apparently. Uh, I leave color alone. It's really important to leave the blit material pass index alone, that needs to be zero because you don't want to do things like a shadow pass on a full screen effect. Obviously the material is very important, you got to set that. I'm going to set it to this old movie effect that I already created. Now the shader graph doesn't do anything except output gray, so you'll see that my scene's gray, but not all of my scene is gray. That's where the very top option comes in. When is this effect going to be run? Right now where it's saying after rendering opaques, that's not including the skybox and the water. So I have to go down to say after rendering transparency. Now you'll notice the screen isn't just solid gray. That's because I've actually already added some post-processing and I have a couple of post-processing effects on. Actually, I actually have a lot of them on, but most of them are just set to their default values. The two that are important that I wanted to make sure to mention here uh, are vignette and film grain. So vignette, it darkens the edges of the screen. That's really important for the old movie effect. You definitely want that on. Uh, depending on your scene, you could make it more or less intense. The other one is film grain. That also, obviously, you could make more or less intense. I tend to make it a bit more on the intense side. So because of that, I'm going to leave it off while we dial in this shader, because I don't want it to distract from what settings and tweaking we do to the shader until we know the shader's right, and then we can turn film grain on. Now it's time to actually work on our shader graph. I'm going to add an input called main text. As I've mentioned in previous tutorials, it has to be underscore main text in the reference ID. That's really important. Then I drag that in, feed it into a sampler node. I'm going to feed this into a dot product to make it black and white. And then I take that dot product and feed it into a multiply node so that I can multiply it by color. See, just out of the dot product, I already have this black and white effect. And then multiplying it by a color gives me the chance to make it sepia. So we'll come in here and pick my color to be a very light tan color. This is something you could fiddle with. A responsible developer would make this as an input and set it from the material. But I'm just doing things quick today because I know what I want to make. Now onto the flicker. I want to make the screen be its normal brightness most of the time, but occasionally dip down and get darker. 
So I'm going to put in a multiply node, and I'll be multiplying that by 1 most of the time, and sometimes less than 1. To get this to be something random over time, I'm going to start with a time node. And then I pretty much always feed my time node right into a multiply. That way I can easily scale how quickly time is moving. I'm going to feed this into a simple noise, into the UV inputs of a simple noise. Now if I disconnect this real quick, you can see that normally simple noise gives a different random value for every pixel because it's reading the U and Vs in. But if you just feed a single value in, then you're going to get a constant output across the whole screen. I'm feeding this into a smooth step with the range of 0 to 0 0.4. And what that'll do is anytime the random value is above 0 0.4, I'm just going to get 1 out. And anytime it's below, I'm going to get a ramp between those 0 and 0 0.4 values. Now to decide how much of an impact it has, I'm going to feed it into a multiply and then an add. And what I want is the two constants feeding into those two nodes should add up to 1. So for example, if I say 0 0.5, 0 0.5, then that add is making it so that the minimum value is 0.5 and then I'm scaling my noise to fit in the rest of it. I could similarly set it to 0.8 at the multiply and 0.2 at the add which would make it a much bigger effect and flip those to make it a much smaller one. Coming into play mode I can see what this is doing. I like the pacing of it. It might be a little bit strong but I'll just leave it alone for now. Next up I'm going to add the spots that are going to be kind of falling down the screen randomly. I'm going to use a Veronoi node, because I think that kind of noise gives me the right look. I'm going to set the angle offset to 100 and the cell density to 0 0.5. This makes a pretty big effect that's going to have not too many spots in it. To make this move, I'm going to do basically the same thing I did in my heat haze. Take my UVs, immediately feed them into a split and a combine, and then take the Y component and adjust that over time. Now with heat haze, I wanted it to move upwards, so I was going to subtract a value from Y. In this case, I want to move it down, so I'm going to add a value to Y. That value is just going to be time multiplied by some constant to adjust its speed, so I can copy paste that from elsewhere in the graph. To make it be mostly on with the occasional spot showing up, I'm going to feed this into a step node. You can see if I set it to something like 0.5, I get really big circles. As I make that number smaller, the circles get smaller. Uh, but the frequency is actually governed by the Voronoi and the settings on it. This is one of those values that you're going to have to mess with as you see it in scene and tweak it to be the way you want. Now to get it to affect the visuals, I'm going to go to the very last node just before it feeds into the master node and grab that color and multiply it by the output from my step function. Because my step function is 1 almost all of the time and then occasionally darkened. Jumping over to play mode, I can see what this looks like. It's got the spots falling, not the perfect settings. I probably want to tweak it a little bit, but for now it's fine. I can move on to the next step. Now the last effect I want to pull off is my vertical stripes. I'm actually going to have a very similar start to the spots effect, so I'm just going to copy a whole bunch of nodes from there and put them above, but in this time I'm going to feed them into a simple noise instead of Veronoi. I'm then going to change the scale of that noise node down to 1. It's going to make a smoother effect, and now I need to mess with the X and Ys a little bit, so I'll copy my multiply node two times and drag that up to where I can feed the X and the Y each into it. So first, I'm going to multiply the X by some really big number. That's going to make my stripes that are really skinny. And then I multiply the Y by some small number, which is going to make the stripes tall. And then just like the spots, I'm going to feed this into a step node. You can see if I set this to something like 0.5, I get a mixture of black and white lines. As I move that number smaller, I get more and more white and less and less black. Since my spots and my stripes are both set up to be mostly white, but black where they're being effective, I can multiply these two outputs together and then feed them into the multiply that goes against my color. Going into play mode, I can see that I've got a few too many stripes, so I need to tweak some things. Luckily, I can do that while still staying in play mode. So I go over to the edge of my step, make that smaller value like 0.1. That's pretty close. Maybe make it even smaller with like a 0.6, and that's about where I want to be. So that's it for the sepia version of this effect. I do want to show the black and white version as well, though. There's a few things we'll tweak. First off, we change the color we're multiplying just to white. Depending on the kind of effect I wanted, I might actually brighten it beyond white to get something even brighter. And then I'm going to take this value that I was multiplying and do a 1 minus, which will make it dark most of the time, but bright white where I want the effect to be. All I need to do is add them to my color, and that'll give me the effect I'm after. Now, being brighter, these lines and spots are probably too big. They should be thinner lines and smaller spots. But that's something you'll need to tweak no matter what, so I'll just leave it to you to mess with. 
If I were going to continue to extend this, the next step would be creating a texture with some little squiggles in white that I can add to this to give the impression of dust on the lens. So that wraps up the tutorial. Thank you so much for watching. If you got anything out of this, please subscribe. I really appreciate all of you. I've got a playlist that you should check out for shader tutorials. You can also reach me on Twitter at GameDevBill. Head over to GameDevBill.com for more videos and tutorials. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate all of you.